On December 19, 2023, a years-long legal saga in Belgium regarding the practice of shunning by the Jehovah's Witnesses finally reached its conclusion. The country's highest court upheld the appeal decision in favor of the Jehovah's Witnesses, affirming their right to practice shunning within the boundaries of religious freedom. Shunning in the Jehovah's Witnesses practice involves disassociating from former members who have been disfellowshipped for serious transgressions or have publicly left the religion. This can involve distancing oneself from social interactions, although cohabiting family members are generally accepted. The Ghent case stemmed from a lawsuit filed by ex-members who argued that shunning constituted discrimination and harassment, uh, infringing upon their rights to family life and freedom of religion. The initial ruling in 2021 sided with the ex-members, but subsequent appeals reversed the decision. And this culminated in the final verdict from the Court of Cassation. The Court's decision hinged on several key points. Number one, shunning as a passive social avoidance. The court distinguished the Jehovah's Witnesses' practice of shunning from cases involving stalking, threats, or harassment, highlighting its focus on limited social interaction rather than active persecution. Number two, re religious freedom versus family rights. While acknowledging the social isolation shunning can cause, the court emphasized that family relationships within the community remain intact and freedom of association protects individuals' right to choose their social circles. And number three, religious autonomy within limits. The court acknowledged the potential emotional impact of shunning, but affirmed the right of religious communities to determine their internal practices within the broader framework of human rights. The Ghent saga has sparked lively debate about the delicate balance between religious freedom and individual rights. Some argue that shunning, regardless of its form, poses an unacceptable risk of social isolation and emotional harm. Others maintain that respecting religious autonomy requires allowing communities to define their own internal norms, even if those norms diverge from societal expectations. The disfellowshipping arrangement causes serious emotional side effects. Number one, disfellowshipping, disfellowship ones believing Washtar doctrine expect to die at Armageddon. Number two, Disfellowshipped ones that don't believe what our teachings realize they will never again freely associate with their Jehovah's Witness family and friends. Number three, children raised as Jehovah's Witnesses understand that the love of their parents is conditional on their remaining part of the religion. Now, some Jehovah's Witnesses feign belief in order to avoid being shunned by their loved ones. The disfellowshipping arrangement affects more than just the disfellowship person. It is also traumatic for Jehovah's Witness family and friends. The practice of disfellowshipping and shunning within the Jehovah's Witness community has long been a con controversial subject sparking ethical and legal debates on religious freedom, individual rights, and the potential for social harm. Delving into the history of this practice reveals a complex narrative evolving interpretations of scripture, and ongoing struggles to balance religious autonomy with social societal concerns. It was not until 1952 that Watchtower introduced disfellowshipping as now practiced, and the following review shows there is no biblical justification for the extent to which Watchtower practices this unchristian form of manipulation. Russell discussed disfellowshipping and avoiding wrongdoers as early as 1893. However, this was not applied to Watchtower followers, but rather that Christians in general should avoid those who show themselves to be untrue to God. Now, as late as 1947, The Awake, January the 8th, page 27, described the practice of excommunication as unscriptural, a pagan practice using Hebrews 10 verse 26 to 31 to show it should be left to God to judge individuals. And you may pause to read this article. Though there is scriptural precedence to limit association with those practicing wrongdoing, 
Watchtower's application of disfellowshipping seriously deviates from Bible guidelines in the following ways. 2 John 10 says not to greet the Antichrist. The Watchtower uses this single scripture to support not saying hello to a disfellowship person. At scriptures such as 1 Corinthians 5, Paul outlined limiting association with Christians that practice wrongdoing, not strict shunning. The Watchtower disfellowships for practices never discussed in the Bible such as smoking, gambling, and having a blood transfusion. Disfellowshipping is also extended to prevent immediate family members associating with their disfellowship relatives. The punishment applies forever or until the Watchtower Society formally reinstates the person. It is considered irrelevant whether the person no longer practices the wrongdoing they were disfellowshipped for. Watchtower is very clear that a disfellowship person is not to be associated with under almost any circumstance, likening them to someone infected with a highly contagious virus. An unrepentant sinner is like a person who has a highly contagious viral infection and needs to be quarantined in order to protect others from uh, getting sick. That's according to Watchtower 2021, September the 30th. The word hello should not be uttered to these ones even in the kingdom wall. This treatment is far harsher than how Jehovah's Witnesses treat a person of the world. Yet, as discussed later, um, the Bible only said that it is the Antichrist that should not be greeted. Watchtower bundles all forms of wrongdoing as the same and enforces the same harsh treatment for all disfellowship people regardless of the wrongdoing that was done. Yes, those disfellowship must not be greeted regardless of whether their sin was murder, changing beliefs, or smoking cigarettes. Total avoidance is extended beyond members of the congregation and to one's immediate family. Few people would consider it uh, acceptable for a religion to demand parents shun their own child, and it is incomprehensible that the following quote was written in the 21st century. If that is not bad enough, Watchtower uses emotional blackmail and says Jehovah is watching us to see whether we will abide. What if we have a relative or a close friend who is this fellowship? Now our only loyalty is on the line, not to that person but to God. Job is watching us to see whether we will abide by his command not to have contact with anyone who is this fellowship. And then says, read 1 Corinthians 5, 11 to 13. But reading the, script, the supporting scripture, um, one cannot help notice that it does not mention the word disfellowship, does not indicate strict shunning, nor imply application to family members. Further, the concept that a son should be bribed back into religion is a thinly veiled attempt at increasing membership uh, numbers and hardly seems of any spiritual value. The existing standard on how to treat disfellowship ones was set in the Watchtower 1981, September the 15th, with no softening over time. The, the 1981 article was quoted in the Kingdom Ministry of 2002 August and the 2008 book Keep Yourself in God's Love. With the advent of JW Broadcasting, discussions of shunning is accompanied by emotionally moving music and storylines, guilting the shunned and shunners into believing this inhumane treatment is deserved and required to manipulate the wrongdoer to return to Jehovah. I was disfellowshipped for more than 15 years. I had two children now, and as time went by, I thought about their future. I thought more and more about returning to Jehovah and the congregation, but I didn't feel worthy. Psalm 86, One day, two elders stopped by and kindly reminded me that Jehovah wants me to return to him. They showed me Psalm 86, verse 5, where it says that Jehovah is ready to forgive thought about that verse the rest of the day. Jehovah is ready to forgive. So I decided to go to the Kingdom Hall for the first time in many years. It made me realize just how far off track I had gotten. I was determined to qualify for reinstatement. Nearly a year later, 
my reinstatement was announced to the congregation. Sonia Erickson is reinstated as one of Jehovah's Witnesses. I was so happy. The brothers and sisters welcomed me very warmly. Being back together again with my family and Jehovah made me feel so good. I knew this is where I needed to be, and I didn't ever want to leave again. But when I'm alone, I struggle with whether Jehovah has really forgiven me. One time I was so distraught that I called my father for help. He comforted me with the words of Isaiah 1 verse 18, where Jehovah says that our sins which are like scarlet or crimson cloth, can become white like snow. Then my father related the Bible account of Manasseh. Manasseh did on a grand scale what was bad in Jehovah's eyes to offend him. He even sacrificed his sons in false worship. Eventually, Manasseh genuinely repented, and Jehovah forgave him. This Bible account touched me deeply. Now, I have to be willing to forgive myself. If Jehovah was willing to forgive the sins of Manasseh, as bad as they were, surely he has forgiven me. What a blessing to understand that Jehovah forgives in a large way. And now, I'm truly happy. With many religious groups, when a person no longer follows their moral guidelines or beliefs, they drift away from uh, church and associate with like-minded individuals outside of the congregation. This is how it is for Jehovah's Witnesses youths that did not get baptized. They simply leave over time but are able to enjoy occasional family association. Yet for youths baptized as innocent and unsuspecting teens, the threat of disfellowshipping is traumatic regardless of whether it coerces them to remain a Jehovah's Witness against their will or leave and lose all those they love. Hundreds of thousands of witnesses are currently disfellowshipped and estranged from their families and friends. The disfellowshipping process causes trauma and Jehovah's Witnesses are often disfellowshipped at a time when they most need help from others. Not all Jehovah's Witnesses strictly follow the Watchtower Guidelines but those that continue contact with the disfellowshipped family or friends conceal such association for fear of being disfellowshipped themselves. The practice of shunning has faced increasing scrutiny in recent years, attracting legal challenges in various countries, including Belgium, France, and Canada. Concerns have been raised about the potential for social isolation emotional distress, and even family breakdown caused by the strict shunning policy. Opponents argue that it infringes upon the right to family life, freedom of association, and non-discrimination. The Jehovah's Witnesses, on the other hand, staunchly defend their right to self-governance and internal disciplinary procedures. They argue that shunning is a safeguard for the spiritual health of the community, protecting it from harmful influences and encouraging repentance among uh, transgressors. They also emphasize the voluntary nature of membership and the right of individuals to choose their own religious affiliations and practices. Finding a balance between protecting religious freedom and safeguarding individual rights remains a formidable challenge. While respecting the autonomy of religious uh, communities uh, is crucial, Ensuring the well-being of individuals subjected to practices like shunning is equally important. Open dialogue informed by nuanced understanding of the history, the motivations, and potential consequences of such practices is essential for navigating these complex terrain. Several critical questions remain. 
To what extent does religious freedom extend to imposing social isolation within a community? How can internal disciplinary practices be reconciled with broader societal principles of non-discrimination and respect for individual autonomy? And what avenues exist for supporting individuals affected by shunning, particularly members of uh, families with disfellowship members? Addressing these questions requires ongoing engagement and critical reflection. Exploring the history of disfellowshipping and shunning within the Jehovah's Witnesses offers valuable insights into the intersection of faith, personal choice, and the potential for unintended consequences. Ultimately, finding a path forward that upholds both religious liberty and individual well-being will demand continual dialogue, sensitivity, and a commitment to finding common ground between diverse perspectives.